Happy Lunar New Year. If anyone who celebrates out there, Gong Hei Fa Choi. My Chinese is garbage. Uh, good morning, Grace Point. My name is Andrew. If I haven't met you already, I'm one of the church family here, and I want to welcome you again this morning and say, whether you're new to Grace Point this morning or you've been here forever, church is not for those who have got things worked out. It's for people who, at their core, believe they need help. And here at church, we remind each other to turn to Jesus, to run to Him who loves to help all who come to Him, and God Himself welcomes you too. Uh, we're continuing our series through the book of Philippians today. Uh, open a Bible if you have one. If you don't, that's okay. There are slides behind me. There's also an outline in the bulletins that you should have on your chairs. But before we start, please pray with me. Father God, would you please help us to understand your word this morning? Send your spirit to us so we might receive your word with faith and obedience. Help us to see know, and love Jesus more from your word. Amen. Uh, when people are stressed or under pressure, it reveals a lot about them. In times of plenty, humans tend to function more consistently. But in times of want, people get desperate. And when people are desperate, they tend to reveal what's actually going on a bit deeper in their hearts. The things that you and I are normally better at hiding from other people, well, they tend to come out. I think of when you're stressed, when the assignment deadlines are coming up, when the performance reviews creep closer, when even family gatherings begin to invade your personal space. Well, those things often reveal what's really important to us, the things that we really hope and long for, the places that we get our self-confidence and affirmation from, the very motivations for why we get out of bed each morning. There's a whole bunch of things that get revealed in times of stress. But the one that I want to talk about today is I think that in times of stress, they often reveal how you and I actually feel about God. When crunch time is happening, how do you think your relationship with God is going? In times of stress, do you feel closer to God or further away? Does it drive you to run to God for help or run the opposite direction? Do you notice guilt and shame begin to drive and motivate you, begin to inform what you think and believe, maybe even keep you up at nights? Perhaps, do you even notice right now that as I talk about your relationship with God, do you notice guilt and shame creeping in? Can I ask you, in your heart of hearts, how do you think right now at this very moment, how do you think God feels about you right now? Do you think he loves you? How do you know he loves you? I think often in times of stress and pressure, they reveal what we really think, what we really believe about God. And I think we often believe, usually at least I do, one of the world's greatest lies. The lie is this. If you do more, God will love you more. If you sin less, God will accept you more. If you are better, God will treat you better. And can I say, that is a lie. It's the greatest lie, I think. Uh, Philippians 3, 1 to 11, the passage that we just read out, it tackles that lie in three sections. It's right there on the screen behind me. A boring old truth, question mark. An exciting old lie, God's truth. Three sections, it's there in your bulletin. Let's get started. First up, a boring old truth, question mark. My guess is that if you're anything like me, you hear the greatest lie and you switch off. You're like, yeah, 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 Andrew, I get it. I, I know it, yeah, yeah, yeah. But can I say, if that is you, if you've heard this truth a billion times before, 
Paul writes this section to you. Uh, Verse 1 of chapter 3 shows us that Paul knows that he's writing the same things to them. Again, he's telling them about the same gospel that they probably already know. He's telling us, reminding us of the same gospel that we probably already know. But did you notice he says that the same old boring things of the gospel are a safeguard for you? A safeguard as if there are things to guard against, as if there are threats threatening to derail them, as if there are icebergs lurking to sink them. Those dangers are in verse 2, but we'll get there later. Because first, we need to talk about what are the same old boring things that Paul writes about. And we see it in verse 9. The same old boring things that Paul writes to them as a safeguard is that there is a righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. The storyline of the Bible is that all humans do not treat God as He deserves. We do not treat Him rightly. We do not treat others rightly. We don't even treat ourselves rightly. And so before God, you and I are not righteous before Him. We are made to relate to Him, but we can no longer relate to Him on the basis of what we do. And even worse, because of our unrighteousness, God being a fair and just God must punish evil, which is terrible because you and I are evil. If left to ourselves, we are doomed before God. But the good news of Jesus is that He comes and He takes the punishment that you and I deserve. He takes our death, dying like a criminal for us. So for all who trust in what Jesus has done in His life, death, and resurrection, all who have faith in Jesus, you no longer have a punishment to pay because He's paid it. Every barrier is removed, and through Jesus, you can relate to God again. You can relate to the one for whom you were made for. And in the eyes of God, he looks at you and he sees Jesus' righteousness. That's what it means to be justified by faith. And that is good news, which is exactly why Paul says at the beginning of verse 1, rejoice in the Lord, because the impossible is done. You can relate to the one for whom you were made for. And let me say something quite amazing. If that is true, there is nothing that you can do to make God love you more. And there is nothing you can do to make God love you less. Uh, Let me say it again because I really think it's profound. There is nothing you can do to make God love you more. And there is nothing you can do to make God love you less. Rejoice. The problem is, I can so often hear the good news of Jesus, just as I've said it just then, and think, yeah, yeah, yeah. I know it already. Tell me something new. The problem is we can often think and feel that the gospel that we know is a boring old truth. Like, yeah, it's true, but I know it. And Paul says, no, you need to hear it again. He says it is a safeguard for you. Never leave from it. Never stop hearing it. Never stop rejoicing in it. Because if you aren't safeguarded by the gospel, you will find yourself not in safety, but in danger. There's an urban legend of a radio transmission that goes on with an American naval ship and Canadian authorities. The American radio says, please divert your course 15 degrees north to avoid our collision. The Canadians reply, please divert your course 15 degrees to the south to avoid a collision. The Americans, this is the captain of a US US naval ship. I repeat, please divert your course. No, change your course. This is the aircraft the USS Lincoln, the second largest ship in the United States of America. We are accompanied by three destroyers, three cruisers, and numerous support vessels. I demand that you change your course 15 degrees north, or else countermeasures will be taken to ensure the safety of this ship. And the Canadians reply, 
something amazing. They reply, excuse me, this is a lighthouse. <laughs> Your call. <laughs> that is what is happening here in this passage. Paul is saying, divert your course back to the gospel, back to the same old boring truths, or else you will become shipwrecked. Because humans, you and I, left to ourselves, always gravitate to thinking, I can do something to make God love me more. I can do something to make God be pleased with me. I can do something to make God accept me. I can do something to make God answer my prayers. Paul says, that is a shipwreck. The gospel is a lighthouse, a safeguard for you. It's the furthest thing from boring, and it may be old and known to your ears, but Paul is saying you need to hear it again and again, because in reality, it is exciting fresh and new every day. Without the lighthouse of the gospel, you and I are bound for shipwreck. The gospel is a safeguard for you against the greatest lie of this world. It is far from a bold, boring old truth. We're at point two, an exciting old lie. Uh, Paul writes to the Philippians about people who try to allure them away from the gospel. Uh, verse two says this, he says, watch out for those dogs. Watch out for those evildoers. Watch out for those mutilators of the flesh. Paul is really serious that the Philippians are on constant guard against them. He calls them dogs. Not like, what's up, dog? No, it's, it was a derogatory term in Jewish culture. Dogs were seen to be unclean because they would eat everything. Dead corpses their own vomit, even dung. It might be your dog, unfortunate. And what was so deadly about these dogs, they were preaching a false gospel. Paul calls them mutilators of the flesh. They were probably Jewish converts to Christianity, and they were going around to Jew Gentile converts, people like the Philippian church, and saying, you're only a legit believer, a real Christian, if you follow Jesus and you get circumcised. They go around with the little scissors and saying, come on, go make it happen. Which is why Paul speaks so negatively about them. Dogs, evildoers, mutilators of the flesh. And we might think, but they believe in Jesus, right? And they probably did in some way, but it's not only when the gospel is uh, subtracted from that it no longer becomes the gospel, but the gospel also stops being the gospel when it is added to as well. Because for this group, their salvation is Jesus and. That's their salvation. In the real gospel of Jesus taught in the Bible, it is never Jesus and. It's never less than Jesus. It's never more than Jesus. They were saying, to be saved, you must have Jesus and circumcision. It is only ever Jesus alone that saves. Not Jesus and Jesus alone. See, the gospel, just like the lighthouse, never moves. However, our trust in the gospel regularly moves away. We always begin to think that there's something that I can do to make God love me more. It moves away from Jesus alone and moves to Jesus and Jesus and my prayers. Jesus and my service at church. Jesus and the way that I serve my community. It asks, what can I do? And forgets what Jesus has done. The lighthouse of the gospel tells to us this morning, move, divert your course so to be safe. The circumcision group, they have moved, not themselves, they have moved the gospel and so we're headed for shipwreck. And that, if you think about it, that Jesus and kind of thinking is what our world is prone to, isn't it? Uh, sure, you can believe in Jesus, but you have to be good enough. I remember when I first became Christian in high school, um, I told people that I became Christian, and I used to swear quite a lot. I was quite a 
bad kind of kid. I still am. But someone came to me who was a, a church, a youth group, a, a Christian, he would say, and he came to me and he said, wait, you're, you're a Christian now? How, how did that happen? How can you become a Christian? You are not worthy. He actually gave me a, a shirt later. I think it was a joke, but it's pretty bad. Uh, the shirt said, unworthy on it. Sure, you can believe in Jesus, but you need to be good enough. Or other ideologies like Jesus only helps themselves, those who help themselves. Have you heard that before? Or even something as basic of, yeah, you trust in Jesus, but you've got to have a respectable, stable nine-to-five job. You might always hear people say that, but in the undercurrents of our society, we always believe Jesus and thinking, as if our works can do anything. But it's not often just the world that's Jesus and, it's often us too in church, isn't it? Uh, when if you and I aren't reading the Bible so much, we can sometimes feel that we are further from God. And there's a legitimacy to that feeling, but I think it says something about, there's something that we can do, which in this case was reading the Bible, that makes you closer or further from God. That's Jesus and thinking. Uh, it also comes up when we go through suffering or stressful situations, like we talked about earlier. Oh, that happened because I did that sin, or I wasn't faithful enough. What does that say about the God that we follow? It says that he's someone who's trying to get even with us, who's examining all of our works to work out, oh, should I give him good today? Should I give him bad? Naughty and nice, Santa Clausy kind of vibe. We are not God's playthings. We cannot do anything to make him love us more or less. God is not a God who just randomly lashes out at you. Uh, it can even come out when we're doing well in wins for the gospel. Uh, when you or someone else is living a life worthy, worth living for Jesus, and as you feel that exuberant rejoicing, I know I catch myself thinking, gosh, God must love me more now. I don't know about you, but I know for me, I love feeling like I'm in control. That when I do something, it has an effect. Uh, it feels good, normal, even exciting to me that I can cause change. I do good thing, God responds by answering my prayer. I do bad thing, God responds by judging me. You know what I'm not okay with? You know what I'm really deep down uncomfortable with? I'm not okay with grace. In my heart of hearts, I believe and often prefer living by works, Jesus and. If I've done good, I love reward because I feel like I've earned it. If I've done bad, I don't love punishment, but at least it makes sense to me. I never gravitate towards grace, never. So let me say it again. You can do nothing to make God love you more you can do nothing to make God love you less. Why? Jesus treats us, God treats us based on what Jesus has done. Our salvation is always Jesus alone. Our salvation is never Jesus and. The lighthouse of the gospel is blaring out to you today and is saying, steer clear. Steer clear. It is a safeguard for you. And Paul reassures the Philippians of this. He says in verse 3, we are the legit Christians. We are the one who is the circumcision, not them. We are the ones who serve God by His Spirit, not them. We boast in Christ Jesus alone. They boast in Jesus and. And Paul calls this Jesus and kind of thinking confidence in the flesh. It's confidence in what we can do. Confidence that you and I can do something, affect change, to make God love us more or less. And Paul tackles this Jesus and thinking with his own personal testimony. Paul says, I pressed the wrong button, this one. G Paul says, if someone, thinks anyone, if someone else thinks they have reasons to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. When it comes to doing and being completely righteous, Paul has got everyone covered. Paul's righteousness started with his parents. He was circumcised on the eighth day. His parents did what was required by Jewish law. Uh, Paul was part of God's chosen people of the people 
Israel. Paul's tribe, Benjamin, they were a special pedigree within God's people. They were the one who produced the first kings of Israel. Before Paul has even lifted a finger, his parents, his race, his societal class were immaculate. Paul continues, moving on from what, what he has done when he was born to what he has now righteously done. Paul is a Hebrew of Hebrews. It uh, means he speaks and knows good Hebrew. It's like those kids who go to Chinese school, and you know those aunties who like, love their Cantonese or Mandarin? I would say the appropriate Chinese or phrase here, but I don't, I don't know it because I didn't go to Chinese school. Uh, but that's Paul. Uh, Paul was impressive, not in Chinese school, he, impressive in Hebrew school. And not just in the classroom, Paul also the workplace. He was a Pharisee, an absolute stickler for the law. His job was knowing the law back to front, and he hit every single KPI. He was that guy. Oh, you hate him. But also, in his heart of hearts, he was zealous, all the way to persecuting who he thought were the enemies of God, the church of Jesus Christ. And perhaps most astoundingly, the work of his hands. Paul was a perfectionist when it came to fulfilling the law's demands. He did it all. People sometimes talk about their testimony and share their testimony about how they came to know God, and they talk about how horrible of a sinner they were. They used to be in prison, sold drugs. Uh, you you kind of know the story. Paul's problem is not that he was so bad, but that he was so good. And that goodness stopped him going to God. When it comes to confidence in the flesh, confidence in what we do for God, Paul topped the class. But even though Paul's CV on LinkedIn was pages and pages and pages, Paul says something extraordinary. He thinks it's all rubbish. Because God's truth opposes the exciting old lie of the works of our hands. Paul takes the pages and pages of his immaculate CV and he throws it into the dumpster fire because whatever were gains to me, Paul says, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. Can you imagine that? Every credential you might have, every good work you might have, Paul says, nothing in the face of what Jesus has done. Jesus' perfect work makes even the best of men, Paul, look like rubbish. Uh, it's kind of like, kind of like imagine you were traveling to Sydney for the first time in your life. I don't know if you've seen this, but I remember on the way out of the international airport, there is this map. Um, on the side of the wall, it shows the city of Sydney, and in particular, the Opera House, the Harbour Bridge. I, I don't think it's actually this photo, by the way. It's actually not there. I couldn't find it, so I actually don't know if it's still there. But imagine coming to Sydney. You're fresh out of the International Airport. You come up to this map, and you're like, wow, look at the, the Opera House. It's curves and architecture. Uh, look at this Harbour Bridge. It's structural beauty. Gosh before going right back into the airport terminal, getting back on the flights, straight back to where you came from, satisfied, thinking that you had seen Sydney. That would be nuts, wouldn't it? There would be no way that would really happen if you had really seen Sydney. When you finally get to the water and you see the opera house, you finally see the harbor, the harbor bridge, and all its beauty and aesthetic, you see it at sunrise, at sunset, at night. Oh, it's amazing. You'd never stop to second glance at that map, would you? You wouldn't pass by it again. Paul's saying, once you've seen the work of Jesus finished on the cross, you'd never stop to look back at Paul or your own work again. It would be rubbish compared to the reality. It's exactly what Paul says. Everything is a loss. I consider them all garbage. Why? Because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. I've seen the harbor. The sign of the airport is garbage. I've seen Jesus' work, my works, Paul's works, garbage. Why would I stop to look at them now that I've seen Jesus? I'm about to get a bit offensive here, so strap yourselves in. 
And the word that Paul uses here for garbage is not a word you would use in polite society. It is dung. It is excrement. It is compared to knowing Jesus. And do you remember how Paul described the circumcision group as dogs who were unclean because they would eat anything? Yeah, Paul's kind of saying they lap up all the works of their hands, all the works that they think they do for God in their Jesus and thinking. Paul is saying they are eating the greatest lie of the world that we can do anything to make God accept us. Paul says that is absolute dog. Your works are nothing compared to Jesus. I know you probably already believe this. I probably already know this. Yes, justification by faith. Yes, yes, I've heard it. You need to hear it again. I'm not sorry. It is good for you. It is a safeguard. There are two righteousnesses in this passage, one from our achievements, one from God. One that comes from law, one that comes from faith in Christ. One is a lie. One is God's truth. The only way that we will ever be right with God is not by what you do, but only by what God has done for you. So can I come back and ask, right now, in this moment, how do you feel about your relationship with God, honestly? I'll ask you another question. Do you feel close to God? Or do you feel far away? If you trust in Jesus, you are safe. You are loved by God. He tells you so. You are justified by faith. Jesus alone. Don't look to your works. Don't look to Jesus' ends. He's got you. In the midst of your darkest sin, in that very moment there, He loves you. In the midst of you cursing your boss, whether it be verbally or in your heart, He loves you. In the midst of your suffering, pain, and confusion, even when you're not sure you trust Him, He loves you. If one day you feel like you've sinned a lot and you're like, oh gosh, that's a, that's a tough day. But the next day you, you go to church, you pray, you read your Bible, you share the gospel with people, you serve your CG. If I asked you, which of these two days do you think God loves you more? It's the same. Because you can do nothing to make him love you more. You can do nothing to make him love you less. I keep repeating it because I know I don't believe it. Grace does not make sense to me. Punishment by works makes far more sense to me. But you might ask here, Andrew, what do I do from this sermon? And the answer is, have faith. And unfortunately, faith, very fortunately actually, faith is not a work of your own. Faith is a laying down of any work you could ever do. It's putting your tools down, your hands down, and trusting in the work of another. What do you do? Trust in the work of Jesus again, who counts you and I righteous on the basis of faith. And watch out. You probably aren't being tempted around by a group that's running after you with scissors, but they probably, uh, you, you are living in a world right now that lives primarily by works. Uh, you live in families, uh, networks of friends, places of work, which all operate by your work. You do things, you work for all those things to function. And those can all be good things. They, they could be outworkings of the salvation, just like we talked about last week, a life worth living for Jesus. But if you're not careful, if you're not watchful, you will naturally sink back into thinking and relating with God by works again. It's all Jesus and thinking. Uh, but don't hear me say that the saving grace by Jesus alone, by faith alone, does not change us, because it does change us. There is a life worth living. 
For anyone who has experienced deep, true, consistent grace in Jesus, people who know grace well show grace well. I'm not sure if you realize, but our church is called Grace Points. I don't actually know why it's called Grace Point. I wasn't here when it started. But my hope is that we would be a church, Grace Point, that's known for its grace, that we would teach grace, extend grace, model grace. But that will only ever happen if you and I know grace well, as Jesus shows it in the gospel. What else is challenged? Well, our hustle culture, our workaholic nature are challenged by justification by faith alone. Because justification by faith means you and I do not need to prove ourselves. Our people, myself included, are so often driven by the need to prove themselves. I must do enough for my society, for my family, for my friends, for myself. I must work hard enough to make sure that I am worth something. That you are worth something. That we are worth something. So what do we do? We run ourselves ragged, like dogs chasing their own tails. Can I say it this morning? That is such a trap. From one workaholic to another, it is such a trap. It is a false lighthouse. Why work to prove yourself when God claims that the greatest work to earn your eternal salvation, your forever resting place, your relationship with God, that work is done, and it's not done by you. You don't need to prove yourself. You don't need to convince yourself that you are worth something. If you're ever not sure if you are worth anything at all, if you want proof, look at the cross and see Jesus crucified for you that God would give his very own son for you. You are more valuable than you could ever imagine or ever hope for. Your greatest achievements or the works you do for God, nothing. It's a loss. It's rubbish. We only ever come to God with empty hands, but the great grace of the gospel means that he fills our hands with value and worth and love more than we could imagine. We are prone to work to make God love us, but Jesus is prone to grace and says, come and find rest. And lastly, justification by faith means that there is peace. Because of Jesus, you and God are good. The most important relationship in your life, the purpose of your life is complete in Jesus. And so you can keep going even when you're rejected. You can keep going even when you're not liked. You can keep going even when your world falls apart. In him, you have peace. You can sleep at night because you're right with God. You can forgive the wronged when you're, when you're wronged because you're right with God. You can treat people not based on what they do or what they offer you, whether they're funny to be around, easy to hang out. Even when they cost you, you can treat others not based on what they do because you are right with God. So Grace Point, how do you think God feels about you right now? Do you think he loves you? Do you know he loves you? Look at the cross Jesus was crucified. Trust in him by faith. Lay down your works. You are safe. You can't do anything to make God love you more. You can't do anything to make him love you less. Watch out for the greatest lie of the world. Hold fast to the same old truth of the gospel. It is a safeguard, a lighthouse for you. Let's pray. Father God, thank you that you justify us through faith in Jesus. Thank you that it is not based on what we do, but on Jesus' finished work. Help us to hold and remember the lighthouse of the gospel. Would it safeguard us and draw us to be people of grace? Would it draw us to find our value and worth in Jesus? Would it draw us to find our eternal peace and rest in Jesus? For Jesus' sake we pray. Amen.